those who watched my four documentaries about the history of gasifier vehicles in the world and the USSR know that the German engineer Imbert is considered the father of transport gasifiers. He saw himself as a German patriot, his company, which he founded with his partner Linnell, manufactured 500,000 gas generator vehicles a year for the Wehrmacht army and for the rear, too. Imbert was also a German-French half-blood who was not perceived by either the French or the Germans on their side. But he believed in Germany and received the highest award, the cross, from Adolf Schichelgruber in 1944. Still, history knows him as the inventor who enabled vehicles to run on firewood. It's hard to beat him, especially if you do similar inventions from scratch, which is what the first inventors of such vehicles started doing in the USSR in the 1920s. Everyone copies Imbert's engineering ideas until today. But from time to time it was still possible to surpass him, and Soviet engineers did so even in such difficult times as World War II. When the war already neared its end, the opposing side's industries were working at their peak. Soviet engineers managed to make a good gasifier in 1944, and it was very different from Imbert's. Soviet and Imbert devices had some common components, but in essence, the Soviet gasifier was a completely different downdraft gasifier with completely different filters. Imbert was surpassed by the design engineer Turbin who worked at the Gorky automobile plant. At that time it was called the Molotov automobile plant. Now, in 2022, it is going back to producing vehicles with carburetors from 1976 because of the sanctions imposed on electronic components. Before the war, engineer Peltzer really wanted to produce his world's best gasifier-powered cars based on the M1 model at that very plant. But these plans did not come true because of the war. The front needed reliable wood-fired vehicles during the war. But at that time conventional gasification chambers burned out after a couple of months. So, engineer Turbin puzzled over a reparable firebox which throat usually cracked from thousands of heats and coolings. No material suitable for mass production could withstand this, neither the Reich's heat-resistant stainless steel used by Imbert, nor a liner, nor the aluminized low-carbon Soviet steel. Engineer Vysotsky solved the issue in his own way, I showed this in previous videos, and engineer Turbin in his own way. But if Vysotsky redesigned only the gasification chamber, Turbin redesigned the gasifier as a whole, both firebox and filters. He introduced an entirely new gasifier truck based on GAZ-42 model. Turbin solved the problem that engineer Mezen had created. The problem lay in a one-piece firebox blindly copied from Imbert's, because there was no time to come up with his own solution during the first five years rush. During the war, the design department of the Molotov automobile plant was puzzling over a gasifier that would be easy to produce and maintain and, most importantly, would operate reliably. Such a model of a truck gasifier was created in 1944. It had a reliable and reparable firebox, an inertial cyclone cleaner, and a radiator-type cooler. There were no other components like battery purifiers or coolers made of complicated and expensive perforated plates. There was also no heavy cleaner with rashid copper rings. In 1943, this gasifier model was shipped with the Vysotsky UTB2 firebox, but a year later, in 1944, it was replaced by the Turbines model. And it is clear why. Although the Vysotsky firebox with a flat pancake worked perfectly and was easily reparable, it reduced the combustion zone by half. Turbin extended this zone by the length of the tar cracking pipe. If the pipe, and, consequently, some meter 100 millimeters of the reduction layer, is eliminated, there will be a lot more tar. I talked about this in a past video about engineer Vysotsky, how he cut the combustion zone and later realized his mistake. The distinctive feature of the turbine gasifier is its combustion hearth. Five tuyeres are welded into the hearth body, not eight, as usual. A separate air supply pipe is welded to each tuyere. This is the only way to make this component durable. All other methods except the one-piece air skirt have failed because of temperature fluctuations. A thick-walled iron pipe was inserted into the gasification chamber throat like a glass in a glass. Engineers experimented with various neck designs, and only Turbin's design proved good in long-term operation. 
the replaceable neck was made from a thick walled pipe with an inner diameter of 110 mm and a wall thickness of 10 to 12 mm. Its height was 110 mm. Three stands were welded inside the replaceable neck. Square 12 by 12 mm steel ring 2 and grid 3 were freely mounted on the stands. Then a cotter pin 4 was inserted into each stand to hold the ring and the grate from falling down. The cotter pins inserted into the stands formed an established annular 15 to 18 mm gap between the lower edge of the throat body and the ring. The annular gap between the ring and the grid was provided by three catches welded to the grid. The new, replaceable gasification chamber was tested on a truck which covered 18,000 to 20,000 kilometers. After this distance, the chamber remained in normal condition and was quite suitable for further operation. Let me remind you that non-aluminized solid fireboxes failed already after 10,000 km, and aluminized ones after 15,000 to 20,000 km, provided they had no defects. There was also no suction through the ash door. As Turbin wrote, the pipe should have been replaced after 7,000 to 10,000 miles. It was so much easier to replace an 11 cm piece of pipe than to disassemble, cut, and re-weld everything. But that's not all. The engineer completely changed the filter system. Only after I had photographed and read about 600 books on gasifiers did I see where Burke got his filtration system from. Great things can be seen only from a distance. You have to absorb the knowledge of previous engineers to understand the way their ancestors thought. Imbert modified Pellis Owen metallurgical filters. And Rashid rings were taken from metallurgists as well. But it is difficult to make battery cleaners and coolers with hundreds of perforated plates even today. Maybe Imbert was using stamping presses and punching machines at his time. Today, it would cost over a thousand dollars, including metal, to cut hundreds of perforated circles, and it would take dozens of man-hours to assemble them by hand. It was too long and expensive to do during the war and even today. I'm not even mentioning the price of rashid copper rings. The pipes of the battery coolers and discs have to be internally coated with acid-resistant paint to protect against the 7% acetic acid contained in tarred water. All in all, a huge piece of work. Engineer Turbin made everything simpler and easier. He managed to reduce the gasifier weight by 170 kilograms. The table shows the comparison. The Soviet copy of Imbert's gasifier filtration system had 852 parts, while Turbin's had only 78 parts. The Gorky automobile plant made two such gasifier trucks for interdepartmental tests, and the commission declared them suitable for operation. See you soon.